So, I'm re-recording this, so it may be late. But, hopefully, you'll find it interesting. I'm re-recording it because during the live, there were some extra topics brought up. And I wanted to adjust some of my notes to fit those extra topics. But I also wanted to adjust the slides, and there has been an extra slide added. So hopefully that all works. The underpaid and underappreciated Merchant Marine of World War II. Well. I will stand here now and say that while some people did recommend during live books on the Dutch Navy, etc., and other Merchant Marines, uh, or Merchant Navies, I haven't... The ones who have recommended me books, those books haven't arrived yet. Um, Amazon doesn't do that quick a delivery of that, ra <laughs> that kind of level of history. Um, and some of those books do not have English versions, which is annoying. But for one of them, I'm very happy to work on my Dutch. I, it's a, it, I did German till I was thirteen, and it was decided that uh, that was the point at which there was a theory going through some schools in the country that um, if you were dyslexic in English, there was no way you could do foreign languages. And to be honest, I was happy to give up French. Mainly because as much as I, it was a really strange relationship. I got on well with the tutor, uh, the teacher outside of the classroom. Outside the classroom, he was amazing. We had a great relationship. We were very, very, he was one of the best uh, teachers I had a relationship with and one of the ones I looked up to and respected most. And yet inside the classroom, things did not work out so well. Things did not work out so well. But German, both in and out of the classroom, I enjoyed that. And Latin was always a favourite of one of mine. Currently, I'm studying Swedish. Ship sh uh, the ship shape Scandinavia to a trip. Which will be announced soon. When people in Sweden stop adding in extra naval history museums. that you know, I managed to get a... Managed to work down Norway, down to two, with a third optional place we could visit. I managed to work down Finland to two, sort of, and when I say optional place, I mean locations we will spend roughly three, four days. Um, going to the various things around there. I managed to get Finland down to roughly two. Sweden is currently at six. Now... There's a small problem with that, because eleven eleven places equals forty four days, and I'm given a maximum length, a maximum length by my colleagues, of twenty eight days. I think we're going to have to split up to get Sweden done. Uh, Sweden done. I think we might be going round in random pairs. For at least, to do at least four of them. Anyway, leaving that all to one side. The underpaid and unappreciated Merchant Marine of World War II. This will focus in, therefore, on the British and American sources and British American experience, but using that to extrapolate out and where I do have specific examples, bring that in. I'd like to point out that the US Merchant Marine were found to have paid during to be paid during the war double that of the merchant navy. However, when you look at the sheer quantity of sources and the sheer quantity of remembrance put into it, you can very quickly get the impression that the merchant navy as the far more appreciated. 
why is this? Well, the thing is, the Battle Atlantic has seeped into our cultural memory. And I noted this when I was talking about the Hunt class um, escort destroyers, the Royal Navy ships, key ship series six, ship three, ship two, ship three, uh, which came out will have come out yesterday when this comes out. And the thing is, we remember the merchant ships in our cultural memory, but. Often when you start discussing the convoy escorts, people's views on them is that there was best a couple of them for each convoy and they were um, very small little ships and they did barely do anything to deal with the wolf packs and it was all down to a heroism of the merchant marine it getting through and the merchant navy. And you, there is certainly a large argument for the heroism of the merchant marine and merchant navy when those convoys were caught by wolf packs. They were literally on the slowest moving objects in there. Big, massive ships for their time. They can't really do much. Although, occasionally, they did actually manage to dodge torpedoes. Occasionally. But, there were usually more than a couple of escorts. And usually in the Atlantic, especially, they'd be things like converted VW destro class destroyers, uh, World War One era destroyers, which have been converted, uh, some four stackers, flower class corvettes, um, some hunt class would turn up, uh, the f castle class corvettes, river, uh, the river and bay frigates. You would have full fleet destroyers and. Uh, both large and small fleet destroyers there. You'd have a mixture. You'd also have sloops. They were always there. And trawlers. You would often have a good half a dozen to a dozen escorts. But still, that's not enough. Because if you think about the escort war today and it's how you do anti something warfare today, you have usually a couple, you will have for each battle group, you'll have between two and four frigates. They'll all have Todoro Sonas. You'll have some destroyers, you'll have a, probably, an, a, probably an aviation ship, usually a carrier, sometimes an LHD. They all have helicopters on them, which are all capable of going out and dropping, well, dipping sonar, but also dropping sonar boys. So you have a far wider net of information able to be gathered, which is a, enables you to push out your bubble of intercept and potential intercept. And that's the thing: the helicopters can the helicopters can always move faster than submarines. So, whereas in a wolf pack terminology, a heavy attack from one direction can draw the escorts in that direction to protect against that, allowing a single or maybe even two submarines to sneak in from another direction, that's less likely to happen because the things that will be moving will be the helicopters. And there's usually more of them than there are submarines. Because submarines are far more expensive these days. So, underpaid and the underappreciated. Should be the underpaid merchant navy, underappreciated merchant marine. That's certainly what I would say. And I would say there are even... The Department of Defense website had some interesting... Interesting, um, I think, misquotes because... I can't imagine the people who they were quoting from would have got it that wrong. And when I say that, I mean I definitely don't believe those people would get it that wrong. Shameless book plug. I get various comments back at this point on this, and you know, sometimes people go, why are you still doing the shameless book plug? Because this book selling is good, and because I 
don't have a second, uh, uh, don't have another book up yet. I'm hoping to soon. I'm beavering away getting it finished and polished off. It's going to be a self-published one. And then at some point I'm going to work on another publisher book. But I think I'm going to wait till I'm happier and I've got... One of the issues I did note when I was putting this book together again, A, I was COVID hit and that was fun. Made getting gathering sources, all the pictures, everything so much is so much nicer. But um, more importantly, and far more majorly for me, it I want the book to be far further along in the process before the publisher gets involved. This one, the publisher got involved at the point at which it was at about twenty-five, thirty thousand words. I'd like to wait for a publisher to get involved till it's finished. At least I'd like to have a full draft. I'd like to be in that level and uh, that level of capability because I think then that makes the whole process a lot easier. If you have all the pictures, you have the first draft done, you go to a publisher, everything becomes a lot easier and a lot quicker and a lot more straightforward for both sides. And there is more time for dealing with the issues which can come with editing. It wasn't this book, it wasn't my book, but I have had friends who've come to me and gone, um, I put 50 cal in my book. Yeah, the editor came back to me and one of their copy editors, and frankly, the head, the, the senior editor had spotted this, but you know, it it could have got past them if they'd been busy as well. And the copy editor had thought for, cal meant calories rather than calibre, and had changed it to the symbol for calories. Fifty calorie gun, for a point fifty calorie gun, really? Um. Yeah, it's the case is whenever you write a book, you hopefully become the expert on that topic. You d dive deep into the information and you really develop a deep understanding and connection with it. You're always going to have a deeper connection and understanding than 19% of the other people who are editing it and other people involved in the process. And that makes it far more of a personal work for you than for them. And as good as editors are, and trust me, Pen and Soul were lovely. They were very nice to work with. There are issues with that. There are still going to be issues. So it's better to be further along. It gives you more time for dealing with any issues. Now, speaking of books, there are some good ones, and these have informed a lot of the work of today. These are the core four texts I have used, and I have, re I have referred to when putting it together. But they are not the only texts I've used, but these are ones I would recommend without a doubt to go start with. We have Tony Lane, The Merchant Seaman's War, Manchester University Press, 1990. Peter Elphix, Lifeline, The Merchant Navy at War, Chatham Publishing, 1999. Harry Bennett, Survivors of British Merchant uh, and Seamen in the Second World War, Hambledon, 1999 again, and Brian Herbert, The Forgotten Heroes, The Heroic Story of the United States Merchant Marine, published by Forge, 2005. All good books. Worth a read. And... Yes. They do provide a lot of good information. I'd say also that their covers are pretty darn cool. Tony Lane's is especially attractive, especially interesting to me. But all of them were definitely fortunate with the cover art. Rather like I was. That was quite good. That's a lovely cover. I do 
warning on the self-published works. I'm designing my own cover. Seriously think they need to add that class into the train to be a historian. <laughs> so, the big issue we are going to be dealing with, though, is propaganda versus reality. And I started off by talking about that in the opening. Propaganda comes up a lot. There is propaganda throughout World War II. One of the things that you have coming a lot, and I'll be talking about this towards the end, is there's a lot of propaganda in Britain about German treatment of merchant crews, a merchant navy crew, a merchant navy crews when they are sunk, when their ships are sunk. Some of this is based in incidents in World War One. Some of it is pure speculation. And some of it is just pure propaganda. There are some actual events. We know of roughly two. Of which, because one boat, uh, one boat which potentially did it is sunk, we only ever actually did a war crimes trial on one. But propaganda can come back and cause you trouble with your own forces. This is why you have to be very careful about propaganda. The reality of the Merchant Navy in World War II was that it was a lot of going backwards and forwards across the uh, across the world's oceans. The reality is there are over 450 series, convoy series. Now, what do I mean when I talk about a convoy series? I'm talking about multiple convoys. Uh, for a convoy series to be established, it has to be convoys not just going there and coming back. It has to be multiple convoys going there and going back. So you're talking thousands of convoys over World War II. Some involving hundreds of ships. So this is where you have to be careful. Because. And please note what I am going to say here. I am being very precise in my language. You will see a lot of media. A lot of the fiction. A lot of the memorializing focus in on the worst experiences on things like pq17 which were absolutely terrible experiences but for every pq17 there's also things like pq4 which pretty much nothing happened the entire convoy they left the uk uh, they left iceland Went to Archangel, returned, nothing. And there is a whole spectrum in between. So, not every convoy is PQ-17, not every convoy is PQ-4. But one thing there is, is there are a lot of ships going backwards and forwards. Furthermore... The ships being built, and I'm going to do some of them for the key, seri key ship series. I think I'm going to include them in there. The Liberty, the Victory, the Park, and the Fort. All those ships built during World War II are built to the latest and best standards. Which means often they are improvements over the ships lost. And often they are far better standard of accommodation, standard of living for the merchant naval per uh, navy personnel in them than in the previous ships, which have been built in peacetime. Built in the 1920s, 1930s, 1900s. Uh, I... There was a stat I once read, which I still do not believe, 
that the oldest vessel that managed to go through the entirety of World War II, doing many Atlantic crossings as a merchant, a merchant sailing vessel, had actually been launched in 1910. And the reason I don't believe it is because I'm just surprised that a merchant vessel was actually going around quite well at that time doing the Atlantic crossings 30 years later, the whole way through World War II. But, if well maintained, yeah. And honestly, there could have been ones there older than that. I... Still, I think that particular book might have been overstating it. So, a well-maintained merchant ship could be around for a long time. There are also all sorts of different convoys. There are the coastal convoys, and there, are, uh, as well as the oceanic convoys. There are Atlantic convoys. There are. Convoys coming up from Africa and going down through Africa. Convoys going through the Mediterranean, but convoys also going around Africa to Alexandria. Convoys going to South America. Convoys going to Canada, Iceland. There are convoy series going pretty much everywhere in the world from the moment World War II begins in 1939. This means there's a tremendous strain on what had been and was for much of World War II, the largest merchant marine in the world. The, Royal, uh, the British Merchant Navy. But still, it's useful when you add in the Norwegian and the Greek and the various other merchant uh, navies which are added in. Why? Despite it being the largest in the world, you will never have enough. You need to move resources far more often in wartime than you do in peacetime. You're moving far greater bulk far more quickly. Because in peacetime, it's economics which sets the timetable. In wartime, it's the enemy gets a vote and so do your needs. And also, sugar happens. Or rather, ship happens. So all these are factors. So what am I saying? The Arctic convoys were no doubt some of the most horrendous convoys in World War II. Not all of them were, though. If... And this is a very big if. If I was really pushed that I had to pick what were the most prone to enemy action convoys in World War Two? If I was really pushed, I'd go with the coastal convoys going up the east coast of Britain. The Arctic convoys would not be far behind that, but the coastal convoys going up the east coast of Britain will have, on occasions, they will be being attacked simultaneously from the air, by submarines and by torpedo boats and find German minefields in front of them, as well as their own minefields. So, yeah. Now, on the plus side, though, they don't have the necessary, the torturous cold of the Arctic. Then you have the Atlantic convoys, where you are miles from anywhere. Thousands of miles from anywhere, like safety or home. Where the convoy can't stop. They have ships trailing at the back of the convoy whose job is to pick you up. But those ships may or may not be fast enough to catch up with the convoy if they do. In which case, they're on their own as well. The overall point is this. Wars are, are absolute nightmares. Wars do not have easy decisions. They often do not have a good option 
are a bad option. They have variations of least worst options. Military commanders of all types, naval, air and land, spend their entire lives not trying to give their opponents problems, because problems have solution, but dilemmas. Why do you present your opponents with dilemmas? Because a dilemma is an option that is where neither option of your choices is actually a good one. Neither one is one you want to actually do. And that was what both sides were trying to do to each other. And the merchant navy, the royal navy, uh, the merchant navy, the royal navy, the merchant marine, the U.S. navy, all the various merchant fleets and navies of World War II, Allied and Axis, were all caught in this constant, constant, multi-tiered, multi. -tiered, multi Actor, multi-source, dilemma, uh, 3D dilemma chess. So, let's consider the career of those who were caught up in that game. Now, the big thing to replace in wartime is not the ship, it's the experienced crew. Think about this, you're looking at this history, this experience, your deck department, your captain will be a master mariner, so the first officer probably. The second officer, or second mate, will have a first mate certificate. Because even once you get the certificate and you've had to learn from it while doing a lower role, you'll then have to do have experience in the role below it so you can study up. It's not just the thing about getting the certificates, you also have to have the experience. So, deck department, master mariners, first mate certificates, second mate certificates. And then even when we go down below that, you've got layers and layers of experience. We consider some of the largest vessels, and we're talking about the big liners here mainly, but some of the large merchant ships as well, or some of the larger goods ships as well. The first mate would have their Master Mariner certificate. Sometimes even the second mate would. The third to sixth would all be holding their first mate certificates, and the seventh to tenth would all be holding their second mate certificates. They would all have done their training. They would all be, you, you'd be a 10th mate, but you'd be a qualified, so you'd have your second mate certificate. The second mate would have their first, uh, would probably have their master mariner certificate. Why? Well, there are a few reasons for this. One of them is the same reason why they are not usually uh, allowed to have the same food. In fact, some lines go so far as to went so far as to require that the chief engineer, the deputy, uh, second engineer, the first mate, and the master, none of them could have the same food. None of them could have the same food. If one of them had sausages for breakfast, the other one was having bacon. And another one was having eggs, and the fourth was getting toast. That was what we're talking about. Because these people are so important. You can replace a ship, you can't replace 40 years of experience. Now, during World War II, some sailors were very unlucky. I, I have to admit, there are some scenarios like... John Slater is a good example. He was on three ships which sunk. Survived. Frankly, I would have the first uh, after I'd gone on with him on the uh, on the ship after the second sinking. Looked at him, and gone. Do you have a ship you're on, mate? I'm not going on, because uh, <laughs> that sounds a bit <laughs> unlucky to me. And a few others were like that, but also some were on the same ship the whole way through World War Two and never sank, never had any action.
most would continue to serve even before the 1941 rule law was passed, which basically changed the scenario so they could no longer retire. They had to stay in service till the end of war as merchant navy. And that was because in 1941 was roughly when it was the peak of losses as well. It's the point at which the mass amount of goods needed to be moved is greatest. The new ships coming online are not quite coming online. The escorts, the ballooning of escort numbers is just beginning to happen. And all those things are sort of filtering in, plus there's a whole load of other duties going on and lots of things spreading around the world, drawing on escort numbers. It's just... It's a really, really critical time. When the SS Athena sinks on the 3rd of September 1939, she's sunk by U-30. Which then surfaced and attacked the ship, sinking, uh, attack, uh, torpedoed and then attacked and sunk it with gunfire, destroying her radio room. There was a loss of 118 lives. Now, why am I using this as an example? Well, because I have readily access in a couple of books to the breakdown of its details. But also, we have, thankfully, very nicely, thanks to the Commonwealth War Graves, we can track down things like, thing, uh, which the British have, like the bellboy, James Marshall. He was aboard Merchant Navy vessel SS Athena, Glasgow. Died on the night of the 3rd of September 1939. He was aged 15 years old. He's commemorated on the Tower Hill Memorial, Panel 12. As I said. One service, the Merchant Navy, underpaid. The Merchant Marine, underappreciated. I'm not sure even if you can say the Merchant Navy is properly appreciated, but they are certainly appreciated a lot more, from what I can see. And amongst the 19 crew, uh, 19 of the crew which, di uh, which died, five of those crew were female, were women, stewardesses, serving on a liner. And one of them was a 65-year-old watch-keeping able seaman. And that 15-year-old boy. And for the uh, watch-keeper, watch-keeping seaman, again, he's on panel 12 of the Tower Hill Memorial. You'll be looking for Charles Fordyce. He was a husband. He left behind a wife, Mary Penelope Fordyce. Serving at sea since he was 14 years old, according to one account I read about him. 51 years at sea. You can't rebuild that. That takes 50 years to rebuild. That's the big problem with the loss of war. The machinery is stuff you can rebuild far easier than the experience, than the personnel. And this is all about experience. You've got an entire rank structure here of experience, responsibility, and learning. engineering department are even more so. The engineering department are even more a focus on certificates, if you can argue it. The engineering department, pretty much by law in some countries, and others by law of the insurance companies, could not go to sea if they did not have a chief engineer and a second engineer who both had first-class certificates in the steam.
the rest of the engineers. And there could be many of them. It could be as many as 10 would have at least the second class certificate in STEAM, which would have been presented after they'd spent years involved of heavy engineering prior to it, ashore. Again, liners often had multiple with the first class and uh, first class certificates in steam you could have you would uh, there were some where they would have a first class certificate of steam engineer responsible for every single engine and the ch chief engineer would be over that also a first class certificate and then you have five second class certificates to back them up and you could maintain that there was always at least two first class and two second class engineers on duty at any one time. Below them you have probably the most dangerous job of any and the most likely to be lost in action because they are down deep in the ship. So if a torpedo hits, they are the furthest to get to safety, the furthest to get to a chance of surviving. And this is where I should probably issue a bit of a warning, because I'm going to use a phrase which some people do find offensive, but there is a reason for it. It's historically accurate, and it still goes around today. The Black Gang. They were called that because, not for any racial reasons, in fact, they were often a mixture of races, but they were all called the Black Gang. Why? Because they were so covered in soot and oil that they were black. Their clothes were black. Their skin was tinted black by soot, coal soot. Their eyes would be black. Everything about them would be covered in black. Especially, especially one group. Now, the senior of them, they're called the donkeyman and the greaser. The donkeyman, well, most of this period they're going to be a he they would be in charge he would be in charge of all the derricks, cranes and all the auxiliary power he's in charge of making sure their donkeys, the ship's donkeys work hence the donkeyman the greaser is basically the chief petty officer of the engines responsibility for Lubrication for keeping order amongst the firemen and the trimmers. The firemen, they're the men who feed the coal, feed the oil into the engines. They're the ones who stand watch of the engines. And then the trimmers. Now when oil comes along, trimming the bunkers, trimming, the, uh, trimming and making sure all the storage of oil, that's... <sighs> Well, that's a lot easier. You can you can do the tanks, you measure levels, and you can pipe it through. You're still probably going to get covered because you have issues with making sure it's going the right place. But there's a lot less of you. When you're doing coal-powered ships, well, you're going to be getting into the bunkers with the coal. You're going to be trimming the coal. That means balancing out between the bunkers by hand, by shovel, by barrow. Physical, heavy labour in a dark, sooty, clogged environment. And you're going to do that for all of your watch. Now, on all ships you have someone called a storekeeper. Now... Usually, on a smaller ship, they're going to be one storekeeper for the whole ship. They're going to be an experienced sailor. Someone like our Charles Fordyce from earlier, who was a watchman. 65, year, uh, 65 years old, 51 years at sea. Yeah, they're going to be an experienced sailor. They are a quasi-NCO, because they're not officially... An NCO, but unofficially they have a lot of power. 
and I have a lot of respect. Larger ships will have storekeepers for the engine rooms as well as for the deckhands. They will be very experienced sailors. And they'll often be called on, called upon to come and help out when experience is needed. It's a way of keeping an experienced sailor in service and giving them a job which is going to be less taxing than their traditional role or their normal or their, their career role was. But it means if you need an experienced hand for doing that role, for helping out, you've still got them. They can come and do the odd bit of help when it's necessary. They're available and they can pass on their wisdom, their institutional memory to the rest of your sailors. Then you have the catering department. Well, you'd have a chief steward. They normally have at least two to three assistants. And a chief cook, who was their equivalent of their NCO, who would again have their own, assi uh, own assistants, one of which would be rated as a baker, and a galley boy. You have these even on ships which are not liners. Even on ships which do not carry passengers. You have them. Why? Because you need to keep the crew fed. Because whilst you would think, uh, most people will think of a steward as someone who is you know, waiting on guests, on passengers, they're also going to be making sure the food and drink is taken down to those men who are trimming in the bunkers. They're going to be making sure all of them are getting the liquid that they need. Because you don't want those men to have to leave their watch, their post, to go get food. You want their experience where you need it. You don't want them gallivanting around the ship hunting for food and drink. But yeah, there are going to be meal times when they're going to come away. Yes, feed them centrally. But if you can make sure there's biscuits and tea, coffee, water going around, that's going to make things a lot easier. It's going to make things a lot more sensible as well. All of this is the experience you need to run a merchant ship. Let's be honest. None of those look easy jobs. Easy tasks. It's also why you, in many, in many of the later ships, in some of the bunkers, you would actually find some very interesting dials and displays to assist the trimmers in their jobs, to assist them in watching the stability of the ship. Think about how much faith the master is having to place in them to balance out his ship. You have to watch it all carefully. One of the things that's often more problematic, I have to admit, from an academic perspective when I'm doing research, but I also think it's from some of the family's perspective, is that with all this knowledge, all these ships going around, all the technology at the time, we still don't have pictures of all the ships. In fact, for one of the vessels here, the SS British Chivalry, which was sunk by a Japanese vessel, the I-37. We don't have a picture of it. This is the memorial in London for the Merchant Navy. This is where the panels are that I was talking about earlier. It's one which is well worth visiting in London. It's not probably... From my experience, it's not part of the normal route of people that, that when they go around memorials in London. But if you're on Tower Hill, and you've got Tower of London on your right. So you're facing away from the Thames. Walk up past the Tower of London. And you'll come to a road crossing. See the road. And it'll be there, on the other side of the road from you. It's worth a visit. 
Now, the thing was, I've already got into some of the propaganda that went on about how there was a lot of propaganda about Germans killing, you know, machine gunning, uh, machine gunning, etc., people in the water. And one of the troubles is that it's quite common for submarines to surface after they've got a torpedo kill and finish off the target with guns. So, this is what causes the problem, because that's a common doctrine across all navies. Uh, which uh, This is a thing which causes a problem with prosecuting war crimes. And one of the reasons why Sir Admirals like Donitz are not put on trial for their naval commands in terms of war crimes. Because it goes across all of them. That was a tactic. But it is the level to which you go, which is often considered whether you matter what makes it a war crime. In the case of the sinking of the British chivalry, the I-37 fired two torpedoes. They're spotted. The ship managed to take evasive action, and one torpedo passed the stern. The second hit the ship in the engine room killing most of the crew down there, the Black Gang. The survivors therefore abandoned ship. I-37 surfaced, shelled and torpedoed the ship. Again, sinking her. This is where you start to get into war crime territory. The I-37 took the British Chivalry's captain, Walter Hill, prisoner. They then moved off and open fire with machine guns on the lifeboats. For the next two hours, they circled, firing indiscriminately, as often described, at the lifeboats and men in the water before finally going away. Fourteen more were killed, another five were mortally wounded. That means they're going to die from their injuries. 38 survivors were therefore adrift for 37 days, well over a month, before being rescued by the cargo liner MV Delane. Captain Hill was a prisoner at Penang until the end of the war. Lieutenant Commander Nagawa, Nakagawa, who was the commander of that submarine, was tried by the War Crimes Tribunal and not just for British chivalry, but also for those for Sutledge, and Ascot, which were February and were also done in February 1944. He's found guilty, and he's sentenced to eight years in prison. But he's released in 1954 after only six years, following the end of the Allied occupation. And it's not until 1978 that it's realised that while in command of the I-177, he had also been responsible for sinking this hospital ship, the AHS Central. In April 1943, with the loss of 268 lives. The thing you have to remember is that these events are atrocious, but often they are remembered because they are not necessarily the norm. We'll be getting into that more when we're discussing this, but there are ways crews could have, even if they were in charge of all orders, to avoid following orders. And we'll be getting into a good example of a crew really trying to avoid those orders at the end of the, uh, towards the end of this video. Now, the British Merchant Navy, British Merchant Navy. This is where we start getting to some interesting topics because the British Merchant Navy, not necessarily what you think it is. It was, of course, heavily British. Um, probably on the region of 68%. 
However, 27% of British merchant marine sailors were either from India or China. A further 5% were British domiciled Arabs, Indians, Chinese, West Africans or West Indians, mainly residents in um, ports such as Cardiff, Liverpool or South Shields. British ports were very, very multicultural from an early point. But they're sort of multicultural where you have sailors' families. Let me explain that. They would be, you would find that quite a lot of the families would end up living in the same places if they were sailors for the same lines. So they'd make friends on ship, and then when they're moving their family into the home port, they'd ask their friends where they lived, they'd know, and they'd look in those areas. And that's often the starting of the communities in the UK. Again, one of the things you have to realise is where these sailors are going to be present. They are not hugely present in the, in the fishing fleet. It's not. The fishing fleet tends to be very local. Again, they're less likely to be present in the coastal steamers, but you will find quite a lot of the British domiciled uh, Arabs, Indians, Chinese, West Africans, West Indians, all those. Some, or Quite a few of those will end up in the coastal fleet. The vast majority of the internationally recruited British Merchant Navy are in the larger oceanic ships. Which means that for purposes of World War II, they are in many ways overrepresented in those crews. They are far more like you are f uh, when you're dealing with a ship which is on an Arctic run, a convoy run, or Atlantic crossing, or going down the coast of Africa, or all those the long range uh, the long voyages. You are far more likely to find people from allied nations. It was also often noted that there was some. It, again, it does. It was reflected in terms of where the people came from as well. It, you know, families get involved in sailing. It was noted that a lot of deck officers came from Northern Scotland, South Wales, Portsmouth, and Liverpool areas. Those were not the only places officers came from, but those were where large sailing communities came from. The engineering officers were from Yarrow, from Hull, from Liverpool and the Netherlands. Yes, there were quite a lot of Dutch ma mari and Dutch engineering officers. Why? They had a similar training system, similar chance to get uh, similar levels of certificates, and would could integrate in the cross very easily. And then, of course, Londoners, because London is one of the largest ports, if not the largest port in Britain, in the 1920s and 30s. And this is the point you have a massive draw of people. You also have a scenario in the Merchant Navy much like you have in most navies, in that whilst you will always have people who are weird, the vast majority are more concerned with competency than anything else. Why? Because the sea doesn't care about anything other than if it can take you out, and the sea will keep trying. And at that point, what you really want on your ship is someone who's competent. That's what you care most about. And anyone who's trying to put anything above competency will either find themselves in a lot of trouble, unless they are very, very lucky, or find very quickly that the people who have put mil built crews which are based on competency are doing a lot better than them. Now, there are some really interesting quirks of fate here also, because there's things like Japanese sailors in the British Merchant Navy. 
Now, why would a Japanese sailor join the British Merchant Navy? Pay is always a good one. But the vast majority are facing issues at home. Again, sailors tend to be and have to be quite educated. Why? No, oh, yes, that it's surely it's manual labor. Why do you need to be educated? Well, you need to have a lot of education to be a sailor. For starters, you're going to travel around the world and you're probably going to get exposed to foreign languages quite often and probably need to pick up a few words if you want to get by and find decent beer and a decent place to sleep. Speaking of someone who doesn't drink, but I spend a lot of time around sailors. Secondly, if you think about the role of the trimmer, probably, arguably, the most physically intensive role on board ship. Think about what the trimmer has to do. They have to be doing maths constantly in their head. They have to be looking at the levels. They have to be judging them against markers and remembering between the different parts of the ships, the different bunkers, what exactly in what. They have to be careful where they're drawing the fuel from. They can't empty one bunker down and ignore the others because they'll make the ship go lopsided and it'll sink. They have to think a lot of the time. It's a lot of brain work going on because there aren't the computers, there aren't any systems to help them. It's entirely done with mental processing, human processing power. Now, if we go back to the Japanese sailors, what am I saying? Well, smart people can find a way to get themselves into trouble that any others will never think of. They will open their mouths. They might disagree with the local military officers. They might go, what are you talking about? That's stupid. When they're spouting something off. If you're a sailor and you want safety... You join the Merchant Navy, which has got the most powerful flag on it. We are talking about the British Merchant Navy. The Navy where there was a ship which probably was British-owned, and probably was flying a British Merchant Marine flag, and the Royal Navy charge into a Japanese naval base with a, cru a light cruiser and a sloop, face off against three heavy cruisers and take it out. Because the Japanese were not allowed, not allowed to arrest British ships without reason. And even then, the process was supposed to be you complained to the British and the British arrested it. So where's the safest place for you to be if you're a sailor who's maybe not on best terms with your own government? In the British Merchant Navy. Or the US Merchant Navy. So this is why Kenji Takai... Uh, or Takiki, Taka, Takaki, J Kenji Takaki, uh, spent his career, his um, <laughs> spent much of his war in uh, Milag North, rather than, uh, well, it's Malag and Milag uh, and Milag Nord. Uh, but basically, Malag was for the naval personnel. Milag was for the merchant marine personnel. And, um, well, the Milag sailors proved more problematic than the Malag sailors often. Um, because they often could speak fluent German, fluent Dutch. Uh, they would do all sorts of things to get out of the, um, of, of the prison. And, well, Kenji... Takakiki, uh, Takaki, became a very famous actor after World War Two and used his skills quite shamelessly, apparently, during his time in the Milag. So who knows what happened there? Now. I've done one incident, I'm now going to be doing another one. And I, the thing is, there aren't many of these incidents, but there are enough. And 
I'm not covering all of them, but I'm going to be covering some of them. The Peleus. Well, the Peleus is the incident which is confirmed. She was traveling from Freetown to Buenos Aires in ballast under her captain, Manus Mavris. She had a crew of 35 aboard. 18 Greek, 8 British, 3 Chinese, 2 Egyptians, and 4 others which would prefer not to say what their uh, nationality was, which could mean all sorts of things. On the 13th of March 1944, in the evening, she spotted by U-852, which was en route to their patrol area in the Indian Ocean. U-852's mission was theoretically secret. Now, this is where we get a problem, because the mission's secret. Captain Hines, Wilhelm, uh, Wilhelm Eck, of the U-852, decided to attack Peleus. Decided that... Despite his, this mission being secret, and I'm supposed to be keeping a low profile, he was still going to attack this. This less than 5,000 gross registered tons merchant vessel. They surfaced. They fired two torpedoes at close range. Pallas was hit. The first exploded under number two hold. The second just after number three hold. So she broke up and sank in three minutes. At this point, all that's left is flotsam, life rafts, and perhaps half her crew have managed to survive. So think about that. She started off a crew of 35, and at best 18 are still alive. Eck took two aboard for interrogation. Aedis Kefalus. Uh, the third officer, and Pierre Newman, a seaman. He established the name and details of the Peleus, and then he returned those two to their life raft. It's at this point Eck starts to worry about the secrecy of his mission, and so he decides to destroy the debris, and the life rafts, and of course, the people have bought them. For the next five hours, until 0100 hours on the 14th, they moved through the debris field, firing guns, small arms, and grenades. They still managed to fail to destroy all the wreckage, and uh, four of the crew actually survived, including Kefalus, although he died later from the wound in his arm. The other three survivors were Antonius Leosis, uh, chief officer, Dimitris Aragas, seaman, and Rocker Said, stoker. They were rescued on the 20th April of that year, 1944. Uh, by the Alexandra Silva, which was a Portuguese vessel, taken to Angola, and from there the incident is reported to British naval authorities, who take affidavits, and, well, they then have problems, because they now know what's happened. On the 2nd of May, 1944, U-852 uh, has a little issue. She's attacked and captured. Runs aground on the reef of uh, Cape Gardfuri, uh, uh, northern Somalia, in the Indian Ocean, and her crew that survive are taken prisoner. Which means that in 1945, five of her crew are tried as war criminals and convicted. Eck, August Hoffman, the second watch officer, and Walter Weitzfening, uh, Weitzfening the boat's doctor, were all executed. Hans Lenz, chief engineer, and Wolfgang Schroeder, the pilot, were imprisoned. So, the United States Merchant Marine. Well, the United States have had an interesting approach to building a merchant marine. They've had academies, they have all sorts of things that they have to try and professionalize. They have the Jones Act. 
to try and support and grow their merchant marine because they realize that an economy such as theirs depended upon having freedom of the seas and being able to move. Goods. And other things around. Well, World War II causes a massive growth in this. Such a large growth that some things have to change, and this includes Joseph Banks William graduating in 1944, the first African American to graduate from the academy. They grew a lot of ships quickly. And very quickly, very quickly, the majority were heard. And the majority's view was competency matters more than anything else. Sometimes war, war is useful for some things. But no. The US Merchant Marine have been built up over time and had grown to what they became. And they really did grow into themselves in World War II. They became a far larger, far more advanced organization, a far broader organization. Now, the SS Tisiljak, or yes, Tisiljak, I was on the Java, Chi uh, Java, China, Japan line. It's a Dutch freighter, but it basically spent its entire life in the Far East. And it was used in World War II to transport supplies across the Indian Ocean between Australia and Ceylon, principally. She was sunk on the 26th of March, 1944. Now, the process of how she was sunk is where it becomes a war crime, because the crew consisted of 80 Dutch, Chinese and, Engli and British merchant seamen, uh, 10 Royal Navy gunners manning the ship's 4-inch gun, aboard were also 5 passengers, uh, Red Cross nurse Werner, G Werner Gornbrin, and 22 Lascar sailors, that's Indian Merchant Navy sailors returning to India after loss of their ship. So you have roughly a hundred and seventeen aboard. She'd been travelling for nineteen days when her captain heard some interesting wireless messages from Perth and decided to change course. At this point, at five forty five AM 0545 hours, 26th of March, 1944, she's hit by a torpedo from the I-8. Lieutenant Dawson, a passenger from Australia, killed instantly. Ship begins to list to port. Order was given to abandon ship. The crew, majority of the bay, but the British gunners and the Dutch gun commander i.e. the officer assigned from the ship to command the gun. Uh, second officer, Jan Decker, remained on board. Their plan was to wait for the Japanese submarine to appear and then open fire. Their idea being to keep the submarine busy long enough to allow the life rafts and, various, uh, and survivors to get to a far enough distance. This they did. I responded with her own deck gun, and, well, that forced the gunners to abandon the ship. Now, once they're in the water, 105 of the survivors were collected by the Japanese. They placed them on I-8's deck. They ordered the captain of the vessel, Captain Hen, into the uh, conning tower to confer with Tatsunok... Uh, Tatsun Osuke Arizumi, the Japanese commander. Survivors heard Hen shouting, No, no, and I don't know. At the moment. Uh, and at that moment, well, one of the Chinese sailors 
slipped into the water. A wet submarine's deck, I can, I'm so surprised that happened, and was shot. The Japanese then tied survivors together into pairs, walked them behind the conning tower, and tied together in pairs, they were attacked, but with various weapons. Sounds so good. Four of those men uh, from the crew, uh, from the survivors, jumped or fell into from the submarine while being attacked and managed to survive the gunfire from three more Japanese sailors. They were Chief Officer Fritz de Jong, Second Officer Yan Decker, Second Wireless Operator James Blairs, and Third Engineer Seas Spubrick. A fifth man. Dang also survived the massacre at Alaska. Though how he survives is particularly traumatic. In that the Japanese, when they killed pretty much all but 20 of the prisoners, uh, tied the remainder to a long rope, pushed them overboard, and then submerged. Dang happened to be the last man on the tow rope. Managed to free himself before he drowned. Survivors managed to find a surviving life raft, and three days later they were found by an American Liberty ship, the SS James O. Wilder, which actually, at first, thought they were a threat, a submarine, and actually started firing on them. But when they realized their mistake, they rescued the survivors and took them to Colombo. Now here is when some uh, things get really interesting because as merchant sailors, the Tejaslak uh, Salak survivors were theoretically ineligible for treatment at both the British military and civilian hospitals, and so had to arrange for accommodations at their own expense. Now there are some interesting stories about this. Either Royal Navy or Merchant Navy, including perhaps some of the American officers seem to have, according to various accounts, either grouped together, paid for it, or maybe one or two of them paid for that, uh, paid for it to make sure they didn't get billed. So as, there's some interesting history about that. Some accounts they pay for it themselves. Some accounts it gets mysteriously paid for by those uh, those other officers. I would say. Um, I'd say it's quite possible. It's quite likely that it was paid for them. Because there is the Brotherhood of the Sea thing going on, but also in many of the accounts, it's basically the Merchant Navy officers or the Royal Navy officers finding it absurd that this bureaucracy is doing this. And that there is bureaucracy interfering. Um, there are many accounts of people railing against bureaucracy and for those who haven't had this experience there are few things more likely to get most sailors merchant navy or national military in this sort of navies uh, naval navies annoyed than bureaucracy especially when it's doing something they consider dumb But, talking about those gunners, a good example of the organisation set up, and the British had their own, uh, the British have multiple groups involved, Dems, they have the Royal Navy, they have the Marine Regiment of the Royal Artillery. Um, the, the British basically go into World War II and start growing them up quickly, and basically as they don't have enough, they another organisation comes up which recruits people from a different source to provide enough gunners on their merchant ships. The Americans see this happening and go, Frigate, we need to be prepared for this. So they have plans and they create the United States Navy Armed Guard. Which by the end of World War II, they're roughly 144,857 men serving across 6,200 ships. An average detachment strength of 23, provide, although very few ships seem to have 23. Most have either 30 or 20. Uh, providing the gunnery, the radio, 
pharmacist mates if the ship couldn't find its own personnel and sometimes even ships radar man in the later parts of the uh, war where there are merchant ships which actually have radar which is an interesting thing because it if you consider some of the ships even by the Falklands war do not have radios for communications and when I say radios, they didn't. They had radios, very, very basic radio systems, which would not work with naval radios. And they were such basic systems that the Royal Navy actually had helicopters going around, lowering chit sheets and chalkboards and handwritten notes down to the merchant ship to give them instructions on where they were supposed to go and what they were supposed to do. You can understand why some ships did not have professional radio men aboard on merchant ships in the 1930s and 40s did not have these professionals of uh, these professions aboard. Now, another ship we do not have a picture of, the Beha. And the Beha incident is It's an absolute mess. It is a mess. Because what we're talking about is three Japanese heavy cruisers. Three Japanese heavy cruisers going into the Indian Ocean. Now, what makes this incident so interesting? Well, it's the sheer amount of information we have about it. When the Allies heard that there was a major Japanese force coming into the ocean again, Somerville directed all Allied ships traveling between 80 and 100 degrees east to divert south or west. Unfortunately, not all were that fast, and not all were heard that much. On the night for March, the British steamer, the Beha, was encountered about midway between Fremantle and Colombo. It was travelling on the first leg of its voyage from Newcastle, South Wales, the United Kingdom, carrying a cargo of zinc. So it's an important ship. It should probably have been convoyed, but again, it's how many merchant ships do you have? How many escorts do you have? How much force do you have to convoy them? <sighs> Upon the sighting of the Japanese ships, Captain Morris Simmons, the Behaz master, ordered his radio operator to transmit the code RRR in order to notify other ships, Allied High Command and everyone else, that the merchant ship was being attacked by surface raiders. Well, certainly that. Three heavy cruisers. Now, on hearing this, Tony signal room, uh, Tony single uh, sig signals for Behar to surrender, but Behar continues to flee. Why is Simmons doing this? Well, anything he can do which can make this take longer for the Japanese will buy more time for others to escape. It's quite a it's quite a brave decision to make. The cruiser opened fire. They didn't attempt to capture the steamer after this point, as they judged it too risky to try and set a get her back to Japanese territory. Tony's gunners scored hits on the prow and stern of Beha, which killed three of her crew, and five minutes after sighting, Beha's crew and passengers abandoned ship. The steamer sank um, shortly afterwards. Between 104 and 108 survivors were rescued by Tony. We don't have exact figures. 
the survivors were maltreated from the beginning. Okay, they were the sailors forced the survivors to hand over all their personal belongings of any value, and this is even by the Geneva Convention of the time, uh, the conventions of the uh, Geneva sort of Code of the time. Let alone the various things which come in after World War Two. We're talking even the rules of war, which had been loosely in place since well before World War One. This is not supposed to be the case. They then used ropes to tie the survivors into painful positions, causing them all to have difficulty breathing. Um, the chief officer was beaten after he complained that the treating of civilians in such a way violated the Geneva Convention. However, after this beating, the female survivors had their ropes removed. Now, please note, all that is done under the auspices of the crew aboard the ship. So, <clears throat> bear that in mind when we start to hear the accounts later. Survivors were taken below deck to be imprisoned. They're badly beaten again, and they are confined in a space which is far too small, far too hot, and they are given far too little water. The Admiral in charge of the force judges that it's too dangerous to continue to raid as the has distress signal had alerted the Allies to his force presence. And so they turned back for the uh, Dutch East Indies that day. They were escorted through the Sundra Strait by two light cruisers and five destroyers and arrived back on the 15th of March. The Allies, though, had, were not immediately attacked, uh, uh, where the attack on the bear had. The stress signal had only been picked up by a single merchant ship, which did not report it until she arrived at Fremantle on the 17th of March, but due to her own security. Shortly after the survivors had been rescued, the Admiral in charge sent a message to Tony's commanding officer, Captain Haru, uh, Haruo Mayuzumi reprimanding him for taking non-essential personnel prisoner and not capturing a merchant ship. Remember, he made the view that it just wasn't any point bringing it back, it would take too long. He also ordered, this rear admiral ordered, that the survivors be killed. Mayuzumi was unwilling to do so. This, he would later argue, would have violated his Christian religious beliefs. And his executive officer, Commander Jinsuke Mi, also opposed us. But they had no qualms about the beating of prisoners, the tying them in inappropriate positions, apparently, and the putting them into a tight, confined space with very little sanitary facilities and no access to exercise and very little food and water. It's amazing. Yeah. But, yes, they objected to the killing of them. Maizumi radioed a request to the Admiral, Sankun, uh, Sankonju, that the prisoners be put ashore. This was rejected. The captain visited the Aobe to argue his case. Sankonju continued with, obey my orders. Now, this is taking place in March 1944. And I'm not saying that there is an obvious level of writing on the wall, but there is part of me which is slightly suggesting that people are thinking about what might be happening post-war at this point. On the 15th of March, when they arrived in Tangchung Priok near Java, um, 15 to 36, we're not quite sure how many of the survivors were transferred to the Oba the flagship. This included Simmons, the Bearhouse chief officer, and several of the senior officers as well as both of the ship's female as uh, both of the ship's female passengers. All this group were then landed at Tanjung Pyong and left there. They sailed the three cruisers for Singapore on the eighteenth of March. That night, all the prisoners on board Tone were beheaded by the cruiser's officers. Maizumi watched from the bridge, and me refused to take part. 
So the captain watched. The first officer refused to take part. It was believed between sixty, uh, uh, somewhere in the region of sixty-five to a hundred, are executed. Um, more likely the latter. Obi, Chikuma, and Tony arrived at Singapore on the twenty-fifth of March. After the war, well, after the war, they were prosecuted. Vice Admiral Takasu, uh, Takasu had died from disease at this point, and he'd been the senior officer who'd ordered the mission. Uh, San Kuncho uh, was tried in 1947 at Hong Kong by the British and sentenced to death, executed on the 21st of January 1948. Maizumi was convicted for his role in the killings and sentenced to seven, year prisoners, uh, seven years imprisonment. Um, he received such a light sentence due to his repeated request for clemency for the prisoners' lives. But Sankonju stated in his affidavit that he was retaliating against the execution in inhuman treatment of Japanese prisoners by the Allies in Guadalcanal. Also stating his defence that the Tone executed the prisoners after the operation had ended, and therefore when the Tone had left his command. The first one I could see, believing pro uh, some of the propaganda and some of the things that actually that did happen there. Um, the second one is a mealy mouth way of getting out of it that frankly I think disrespects his own uniform saying they executed the command I had given them after they left my command so therefore I'm not responsible for them doing it is yeah that makes me question the first part honestly it's one of those things that you have to be careful when you mount a defence in a legal case in law because your own arguments may count against you. And I certainly, I certainly do the second I think the second argument count against the first. But the fact that Mayuzimi had so much documentation of him requesting the light uh, requesting clemency and all those things and still fold it through Mm. I don't think the Japanese officer corps equipped them, uh, equip themselves well in that particular uh, particular event. But losses overall in World War II, well, they are quite dramatic. And this video is not going to get live for 7 o'clock this evening. The British Merchant Navy, 185,000 served during World War II. 185,000. thousand seven hundred forty-nine, or nineteen point eight six percent, were lost. Once you add in the five thousand seven hundred twenty taken prisoner and the four thousand seven hundred seven wounded. You get to roughly twenty-five and a half percent of those who served, or forty-seven thousand one hundred seventy-six. And according to Harry Bennett, in his book, there could be up to six thousand two hundred twenty-eight more who died but are not commemorated. The equivalent of the the British equivalents of the U.S. Naval Armed Guard, the Naval Dems Gunners, and the Maritime Regiment of the Royal Artillery lost two thousand seven hundred thirteen and one thousand two hundred twenty-two respectively. I did in consider putting them in this video but I thought that would be three extra slides and frankly the USNAG provide allow me to cover this, the roles they did without me having to go into so much detail it ends up being a three hour long video and I I know I've had comments of people going yeah I don't mind videos being longer but I like I, I, I like them to be at the length with which the majority complete them, and it's if it's 90 minutes or less, then I've got over 50% completion, which I like. Although I'm never quite sure about that with YouTube, whether they count the people who watch in sections. So, of those lost, well, for the British Merchant Navy, we have a quite good breakdown. Again, thanks to the um, Commonwealth War Graves Commission, mainly. 
the figure for the 26,543 of the British Merchant Navy includes South Africans, at least 182, New Zealanders, 72 to 446, and Chinese. No exact figures, but well, a lot of them. The Indian Merchant Navy, 6,114. The Lascars have been serving Britain's merchant fleet and serving in the Royal Navy at various points for several hundred years by this point. Once again, serving. The Merchant Navy Naval Auxiliary Personnel, 1,495. Uh, that's another British establishment. The Canadian Merchant Navy, 1,271. The Fishing Fleet of Britain, 878 lost. The Australian Merchant Navy, 441. The United States Merchant Marine, 215,000 served in World War II. It rises to 250,000 if the years 1939 to 45 are used, rather than the years 1941 to 45. That can sound like a massive differential of 35,000, but it makes sort of sense when you look at some of the figures and some of the churn of things. And the amount of people who would serve one or two years and then decide the merchant, li a merchant life wasn't for them. So there was a lot of churn prior to war. A lot of people in war service were ser signed on for contracts that meant they served for the war or for the duration of the war. In Britain, of course, Act of Parliament passed in 1941, which made that the case. 8,651 were lost, rising to 9,521 if the years are 1939 to 1945. So between 4.02% and 4.43%. Some people use this as for various cases and various um, arguments they like to make, which are completely straw in my mind. Basically, the advantage the U.S. Merchant Marine have is they often have better ships when they get into war because of the huge Liberty ship and Victory ship construction programs. But also, and this is more important in many ways, there is a level of experience available. And whilst some in the U.S. Naval Command are not happy to take advantage of their experience, the vast majority are, and there are ways found to give it. As I was talking, I think, um, in a video about the Women's Royal Naval Service and their role in the anti-submarine war, especially their role in sort of advising and wargaming and, and the things that... The fact is, there were ways found around various edicts about you shouldn't take, listen, go listen to those briefings. Well, the briefings would take place down the pub, and it would be, oh, we're getting together with some pretty young ladies down the pub. It just happens to be a pub which is very specially selected because the owner makes sure it's all secure and quiet, and that the only people in there are him serving the drinks and the pretty young ladies who are not discussing their, uh, discussing what you normally expect people to be discussing on a date. Or maybe it is. Depends on what, what dates you go on. Um, <laughs> considering some discussions I've had on some dates I've been on in the past, maybe I shouldn't be making too many comments on that one. <sighs> World War Two is... I would love to say, you know, the, the, the words which often come out, a conflict like no other, but actually there have been wars like it. There are global wars, there are conflicts which are like this. They're never good. We, you know, we can think of the merchant, uh, the campaigns of the 18th and early 19th century involving privateers, etc. Merchant ships are often at the front of warfare because they are so useful. A ship can have crossed money multiple times before it sunk and carried many cargoes, but also when you lose that ship, you don't just lose the cargo you lost, you lose the movement of the cargoes backwards and forwards. The 
you lose that potential until it's replaced. You lose the experience that's lost. Because even if a lot of the officers and crew survive, how many have you lost? And even if all survive, there's probably going to be some injured. Some are going to be in hospital. You're not going to have them for a few months. And you need those people. Those ships aren't sailing without the experienced people. World War II was a logistics war, an attrition war, a global effort. Sometimes I get critiqued in videos because I say things like, it's unlikely for the, uh, the Axis, it's basically impossible for the Axis to win. People go, well, you know, the Wonder Weapons, this, that, no, it's logistics, it's infrastructure. It's the sheer scale of what they're taking on. The British Empire alone is colossal. Combine the British Empire and America, you've got the two biggest industrial bases, infrastructure bases, population bases that can be mobilized for a modern war in the world at this time. Japan added China to that mix. And there is a reason why one of the constants that you always hear discuss about things never have a land war in Asia. And people will say, well, you know, the Japanese would the Japanese might have been winning or might have been losing, but either way, it was supping up a lot of their forces. It was taking up a lot of their capability to fight in China, which meant they never had those forces to fight against America and Britain. And again, if you're going to be taking on America and Britain, you probably don't want to be taking on someone else as well and losing all your ground forces and all your best ground troops in that. And none of that can happen without a decent merchant marine, without the merchant navy, without the ships, the crews, the experience. Now I would love to say that it all gets good from this point onwards. That the war's over and everything goes well. Well, it doesn't. The British have this black, uh, this black spot on their record. Is or rephrase my grandfather we used, but uh, some uh, he might it would have mean, uh, used it to mean something a lot stronger. Chinese sailors had had a long tradition of service in the, in the British merchant navy and. They'd at certain points had issues in World War II, even going on strike at one point, because of they hadn't been paid. But after that strike, they did secure a £2 a month pay rise, because they often earned a third of their pay of the European counterparts, and, a ten, and access to the £10 a month war risk bonus. Many of them were married. Many were married and settled. And the one of the interesting thing is to note is that while this takes place in Liverpool, and... It definitely does affect the Blue Funnel Line's employees and a lot of the ones in Liverpool. It actually isn't spread out as much as you would think it should be for nationwide. It seems to be other police forces are rather less than keen on implementing it. And it's um, it caused a debate when discussion live because I asked the question of did you think Churchill would do it and. Them and he went, oh yeah, Churchill would have done just the same as the Labour Party, but there are quite a few who pointed out that Churchill is a bit of a paternalist, and also these people had served through World War Two. they'd fought alongside this would feel like stabbing them in the back to Churchill the thing is, Attlee had been part of that government, and Attlee was Prime Minister at this point He's one of the most successful Labour Prime Ministers of all time. He's certainly one of the better Prime Ministers Britain has had. And this is something I just, myself, I know he must have known of. He must have known what James Chunter Ede, who was uh, born in Epsom, so shared that with him, was doing. I just can't reconcile it with the rest of him. But pretty much, they forcibly deport... Chinese sailors for no other reason than they are Chinese. There is no other way to push that up. It started at the end of 1945. It continued at least until December 1946. 
and their reason for keeping it going, even when they find out that they suddenly realize, hang on, a lot of these people are even the married ones, the ones who are settled in Britain are being sent as well, was that if they stop it, it might embarrass the immigration officer of Liverpool, the police, and the shipping companies concerned. And that is terrible. That something might embarrass people is the reason not to stop. That is... It's disgusting. There is no other way to say it. They get the blue funnel line, which had been primarily dependent upon Chinese labor in order to keep their line as cheap and as, uh, cheap as, operate, uh, as operating as possible, um, actually modified their ships, the Diomede, the Menelis, the Priam, the Sarpen, and the Theseus for the task. And most of these people never found again. No one really knows what happened to them. They're deported to China, they don't come back in. There are families broken up. Women have their husbands go out for an evening's drinking uh, or to play mahjong and do not come home. But their stuff's there. Bessie Braddock, MP, does massive work to try and rectify it. She's the MP for Liverpool Exchange and she finds it as telling as everyone. But it's one of those things which... Honestly, their entire reasoning seems to be something along the lines of, okay, well, war's, uh, war's over, the, sh the Merchant Marine, all these things are going to shrink. We don't want to affect British sailors, so we're going to send these people home. Because these people won't cause us trouble if they get sent home, because China's not part of the Commonwealth. China's not part of the Empire. If we pick on any of the others... It's terrible. Now we have this incident. Well, yes. This was brought up during the live. And whilst I do not think that the person was bringing it up to try and make the case of equivalency, because frankly, that just doesn't work. That's not a good argument ever to make. Oh, oh it, either, you're either making the argument that one thing doesn't is excused by you doing the other thing, or it just it's not the argument. But they did start talking about the phrase victor's justice, and there is a small problem with that. In that, we look at this event of exactly what happened. Now, HMS Torbay torpedoes some ships on her first commission, her first Patrol in the Mediterranean. Twice, and she record, and it was recorded in logs, and it was object. What was object? To it was objected to at the time by her own executive officer in some regards for what they were doing. They torpedoed it, and then they started mach using their guns on the remains of the ship to make sure it sunk. And they include things like some of the flotsams on the jetsam and life, but uh, some of the life rafts also get hit. Now, I don't like that. I frankly think that's atrocious and shouldn't be done. But the trouble is, the prob uh, there are two problems in a scenario. One, that is a recognized standard naval, war uh, naval submarine tactic in this at this point in the war and this period. And two, there is, of course, the propaganda going around everywhere in Britain at this point of the Germans are doing that to British, uh, British merchant ships and British civilians. And the thing is, these are people... Uh, the people in the water who were apparently being machine gunned were people who were presumed to be wearing uniforms. Now, the commander, Anthony Myers, who orders this, goes on to win a VC later in the war, which makes things even more complicated. And is an absolutely in interesting character, is the phrase I would use. It. He regularly orders his crew to um, drop trouser and moon the Vichy French, uh, moon, not the Vichy French, the French, when he goes through, uh, French ships when he goes through Alexandra Harbour. 
for what reason, who knows? Um, they were just doing their duty. And yeah, you can argue they should have stayed fighting, but there's no reason for really to moon uh, ha to moon them so regularly that EU uh, have it as a standing order. It reaches up senior command. He is very quickly told never to do this again. Never. It's not the British way. And if it's found out by the Germans that it's being done, it could cause all sorts of interesting reprisals on prisoners, etc. And they just don't want to do it. Every admiral who gets involved says, no, you don't do this. The thing is, comes to light in 1989 in Ludovic Kennedy's autobiography. In, well, biography, not autobiography. In a perfect world, you'd have probably replaced him. In a perfect world, he'd have been pushed out of the service for it. But in 1941, the Royal Navy doesn't have enough personnel to start getting rid of someone for, break, uh, for breaking rules which aren't yet written and following a tactic which is an accepted tactic for some Marines. It very quickly becomes a not accepted tactic and established it's not accepted in the Royal Navy after this point. But it's that's the problem when you start looking to war crimes. What he doesn't do is get anyone out of the water, interrogate them and then put them back. What he doesn't do is throw people off his deck or anything like that. So It's still... I don't think I'd consider it Victor's justice that they aren't tried in any way, shape or form. But... I also consider it close enough that I find it very problematic in terms of British history. But again, the crew objected to it at the time. And... From some of the accounts, uh, the crew followed orders, but they followed orders in a creative manner. But What else have we got coming up? Well, next week, it's the Capital Ships of Science uh, fiction, Battle Stars vs. Star Destroyers. I don't think I'm going to include a question in this video because it's going to be long enough that I'm going to have enough in it that I'm fairly sure it's going to generate comments and questions and discussions without that. And honestly, it's late. It's already past 7 o'clock and this is supposed to have gone live at 7 o'clock. But I wanted it done right. And in my world, I am making a decision from now on with videos. I prefer them to be done right than to be on time. If I'm happy with them, they go out. And I'm probably going to cause me upset with the allographer, but that's it. I'm going to take be less worried. Besides. I've already done so many videos with questions this last week that I've got tons of questions to look at. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. It's going to be brew ships tomorrow evening. I'm not sure what books we'll look at. It might end up being a question brew ships because I've had an interesting week. Um, finishing on this level seems all seems strange, but my mum's had a lot of asthma attacks this week, and it's not necessarily been the best week for the family from that perspective so I haven't been able to do my usual reading prep but there again I might be able to pull some books together because I've got some books I'm sort of reviewing at the moment I'll see thank you very much for watching hope you found it like
there are other sections you hopefully you probably didn't find enjoyable at all so i can't finish on my usual saying i hope you found it enjoyable so i hope you found it interesting and hope you found it useful thank you very much and take care